Hey, if you're joining us at Sparta, we welcome you today. And if our Baxter campus, you guys are watching in, thank you so much. We love you. Livingston campus, we're so excited to have you. Now listen, Livingston campus. Amanda and I were able to join 50 of you guys from Livingston uh, this past Monday night at your Valentine's banquet. And we were asked to be at the uh, dating game show on that thing. What is said at the Valentine's banquet stays at the Valentine's <laughs> banquet, all right? For those of you who are watching us all over the world, we welcome you. Thank you for watching us. Many countries, dozens of states, we're so welcome you. And for all of you in the correctional facilities, we're so glad you've joined us today. Let's give them a hand. Would you do that? <clears throat> Hey, if you came to hear Pastor Bobby, I'm sorry. He's not here this weekend. He'll be back next weekend. Please come back and hear him. He is worth, if you've never heard him, he is worth coming back for. He is one of the most fantastic teachers of the Word of God in the land today. Don't we all agree with that? Amen. And we're so glad, we're so glad to sit under his ministry. Well, if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Pastor and Jenny were talking about marriage and the upcoming marriage conference. And Pastor, our wonderful pastor, has uh, designated February as the uh, theme for the month for our messages is relation shifts. Not relationship, but relation shifts how relationships require us to shift some things in our life. And the first Sunday, uh, Dr. Mike Courtney taught us about uh, marriage becoming your ministry. And then last week, our pastor did a just phenomenal job teaching on love and what that really is all about. So today, I want to talk a little bit about marriage. And let's begin with this verse. Now, for those of you who are not married, just hold on. Don't leave yet. Uh, don't leave. Just hold on. You might want to get married. So these are some things you can, you can take some notes of. For those of you who are married and don't want to be married, don't leave yet. These are some things you need to work on. And for those of you who are not married and never want to get married, this is some things you can tell your siblings, your children, your grandchildren, some things to do, all right? Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 21. There's always two questions we ask when we read the Bible. Number one, who's writing? Number two, who are they writing to? We know that the apostle Paul is writing. He's inspired of the Holy Spirit. So we can say the Holy Spirit wrote this through Paul. And then who's he writing to? He's writing to Christians. He's writing to Christians. He's not writing to the world. He's not writing to non-believers. He's writing to Christians. So if he was in Cookville today or wherever you are, he would be writing to you if you know Christ as your Lord and Savior. Listen to what he says. Verse 21, Ephesians chapter 5. Submit to one another. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22. For wives, this means submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. And all the men said... Life Church is full of henpeck men, I guarantee. <laughs> For the husband is the head of the wife, ah, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of his body, the church. As the church submits to Christ, here we go, so your wives should submit ah, to your husbands and everything. And all the men said... I promise you, you will not say amen to that when you're in the car alone with her. <laughs> Verse 25, for husbands, for husbands, this means love your wives. Just as Christ loved the church, he gave up his life for her. So that means you are to give up everything for her. Your tree stand, your golf clubs, uh, your, your hobbies, your friends. And all the women said, Amen. see there. <laughs> Verse 27, he did this to present her to himself as a glorious church without a spot or wrinkle or, or any other blemish. Instead, she will be holy and without fault. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as they love their own body. For a man who loves his wife actually shows love 
for himself. No one hates his own body, but feeds it and cares for it, just as Christ cares for the church, and we are members of his body. Verse 31, as the scriptures say, and you can go back to Genesis and read where it said this, a man leaves his father and mother, and he's joined to his wife, and the two are united into one. This is a great mystery, but it is an illustration, an example, a reflection, he's saying, of the way Christ and the church are one. So again, I say each man must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. February is the month of love, and uh, so let me ask this question. How many of you were treated to a romantic dinner this past week for Valentine's? Raise your hand if you were treated. Wow, seven of you. That's remarkable. <laughs> Out of a room of 1,500, seven's pretty good. Well, let me lower the bar a little. How many were treated to dinner, maybe not romantic dinner, but dinner outside of the house for Valentine's? Raise your hand. Oh, a few more. Well, let's find something to salvage out of this topic. <laughs> How many of you didn't do anything special for Valentine's, but you thought about it? Raise your hand. All right. Finally, how many of you babysit the grandbabies on Wednesday night so your children could go out for Valentine's? We did that. Did you know that Valentine's night is one of the busiest times of the year at gyms and workout facilities? Valentine's night is one of the busiest times of the year at gyms and workout facilities. You say, why? Because all the singles are there working out their frustrations <laughs> on that equipment. In a couple of years, a couple of months, in a couple of months, Amanda and I will be celebrating 44 years of marriage excitement. Isn't that cool? 44 years. I married her when she was three. Those things were allowed in Columbia, Tennessee back then. It was the spring of 1975. I was 17. I'd just gone to a graduation service a uh, graduation of high school graduation of some friends of mine. I had just finished my junior year, and some friends I had were seniors. They graduated. I went to the graduation. And as I walked out of the graduation, I, went, I looked across the parking lot, and there was this beautiful, stunning, knockout, cotton top blonde talking to one of my friends, a, a, a girlfriend, a friend that attends our, my church. And I didn't really like the girl who attended our church, but I was very interested in who she was talking to. So I made my way over there to talk to this beautiful girl. I conveniently made my way over there, and I put the smooth on her, and fate was forever sealed. I was 17, and she was 14 when we first met. A few months later, I asked if I could come over to her house and see her. She had turned 15, and we started dating the following year and have been dating ever since. So we're getting in, in a couple of months, we'll be married 44 years, and we dated for five years before that. Can you imagine that? I can't hardly believe it, that almost 50 years together, and it just gets better and better and better. Quite often, people ask us, what is the secret to a long, healthy marriage? Because, you know, people being married a long time, sometimes that's an oddity. So when you hear somebody being married and still excited about marriage, still in love, that's kind of an oddity if they've been together for a long time. So that's, we're asked all the time, what is the secret? And a young lady recently asked Amanda, that question, what is the secret to a long-term marriage? And so I overheard it, so I perked my ears up to hear what Amanda was going to say. She says, she told the young lady, well, it isn't really a secret at all. Forgiveness is the key, and I'm a forgiving woman. A long time ago, I forgave Eddie for not being Sean Connery. That's what she told me. <laughs> Amanda and I have learned this truth in all these years. The longer you're married, the, the easier it is to talk about the tough subjects. You don't want to talk about the tough subjects the early years because you don't know how 
your, your mate will react to that, and you don't want to hurt their feelings, and you don't want them going off pouting, you don't want him going off and being mad or going off on you. So you leave the tough subjects alone. In fact, you, you won't even talk about them. But the longer you're married, you talk about the tough subjects. And one of the tough subjects is this. If something happens to me, would you remarry? If something happens to me, would you remarry. And it reminds me of the young couple that, they wasn't young, the older couple who, who were, got on that subject. And so the wife said, if I were to die first, would you remarry? The wife asked her husband. Well, the husband said, I'm in good health. Why not? Then the wife said, well, would, would she live in my house? And he said, well, we just got it paid for, and I'm not going in debt again, so yes, she would live in your house. The wife gets a little more stern. Would she drive my car? He said, yes, it's a brand new car, and there's no use buying another one, so yes, she would drive your car. And then she said, would she use my golf clubs? He said, no, she's left-handed. So you see... Uh, <laughs> You can take these conversations a little bit too far. Do you understand marriage? Marriage is a binding relationship. Marriage is a binding relationship between a man and a woman. Let me repeat that. That's what we believe here at Life Church. That marriage is a, a, a binding relationship between a man and a woman. And we'll not back up on that, all right? <laughs> Marriage is a relationship, binding relationship between a man and a woman. It's ordained by God to help bring fulfillment, purpose, and the blessing of partnership to both of the individuals. Marriage is a binding relationship. It's not an optional relationship. It's a binding relationship between a man and a woman ordained by God. This is not just something, hey, let's go do it for convenience. A true godly marriage for Christians should be ordained by God. We get God's approval on this. God has blessed this. And why has he blessed it? For the purpose to bring fulfillment to both their lives, purpose for both of their lives, and the blessings of partnership. Because two can do a lot more than one, according to the Word of God. So that's what marriage is all about. Unfortunately, we live in a culture now that increasingly devalues the sanctity of marriage. More couples are living together outside of marriage than in any other time. Because people have a skewed, sour unhealthy view of marriage. According to the census data from 2020, 40% of all marriages end in divorce. 40% of all marriages end in divorce. They also tell us that 67% of second marriages end in divorce. And 73% of third marriages end in divorce. And what's amazing about those alarming numbers is they're down. And the reason they're down is because now people are choosing not to get married, which is such a sad scenario because marriage is absolutely wonderful. It's ordained by God. In 2008, a crazy statistic came out by Lifeway and the Barna Group which is a Christian organization, a statistic was delivered or released in 2008 that stated there was no difference in the divorce rate of Christians and non-Christians. That going to church and serving Jesus didn't really affect the divorce rate among individuals. That approximately, in 2008, they said approximately 50% of all marriages are going to get divorced, whether you're a child of God serving him with all your heart or whether you're not. And that alarmed so many people, and I heard it repeated over and over and over and over again. But the truth was that st statistic was found to be inaccurate. That statistic was not based on factual data, but projections 
that the divorce rate would increase because states were starting to pass non-fault divorce laws. Non-fault divorce. Fortunately, it never materialized. Those statistics never materialized. In fact, the opposite statistics materialized. That an active faith life does make a difference in the length of a marriage relationship. They've learned this. Christians, couples who actively attend church regularly, couples who actively attend church regularly are 35% less likely to get divorced. Couples who actively attend church regularly are 35% less likely to get divorced. And couples who keep God at the center of their home and family, couples who keep God at the center of their home and family, stay married at far greater rates and thrive more in their marriages. Those statistics recently came out by Dr. Brad Wilcox, president and director of the National Marriage Project. So one reason... That couples who attend church regularly and put Christ at the center of their home stay married in a healthy relationship longer is because when your commitment, your first commitment is to the Lordship of Jesus, you put fewer expectations upon your spouse to meet your emotional needs that only God can meet. See, when we put God first in our home, when we put God first in our marriage, we put less expectations upon our spouse to meet some needs emotionally for us that only God can meet. And can I tell you something? Amanda and I found that to be true many years ago. We'd been married for four years. I was 26 and she was 23. We were pastoring our little church. We hadn't been at all good very long pastoring Little Trinity, which was real small back then. And I did not know anything about pastoring. I'm 26 years old. I graduated from university, the first member of our family to ever graduate or go to college and graduate from university. I had studied. I had my minor in biblical languages, Greek and Hebrew. I would graduated. I would passed all the tests required for ministerial credentials. That took three years. I passed all those tests to do that. But I was faking my way through pastoring. I didn't know anything about pastoring. And the tolls of pastoring, trying to meet the demands and the expectations of people were having an adverse effect upon our young marriage. My dad wouldn't even talk to me. He didn't want me going to ministry. He said, when you go broke, don't come crying to me. And then when we went to All Good, he said, I'm never coming to see you. What in the world would make you want to go to that little stupid little town? So Amanda and I, after a few months pastoring there, we found ourselves totally alone and broke. I would come home from the church and be downhearted because of the criticism I received. Much of it was valid. I wasn't a good pastor. Or the, I was down because the finances didn't come in to pay the bills of the church. For the first year, 50 straight Mondays, the banker from First Tennessee Bank called me and won't know what the church offerings were. He didn't even attend our church. Listen, when the banker's calling, you won't know what the church offerings were. It's not because he's wanting to make a donation. Bankers don't make many donations. They take deposits. Because he knew if we didn't bring in $500 a week as a church, the church mortgage couldn't be paid. So 50 straight weeks, he called me on Monday. What was your offering, preacher? Many times, we didn't get a salary for the week. Because the church mortgage had to be paid or the church insurance came to do. And then I'd pray and I'd do everything I knew to do. Visit the few people who were there and talk to people in the community. And people would come visit the little church, but they'd never come back. And that would cause me to be downhearted. And I, why wouldn't they come back? I knew I wasn't that great a preacher, but I was a lot better than the Methodist guy down the street. And, and, uh, and, and I could, we just didn't have everything that other churches had. We didn't have all the cool stuff. We didn't have tiny town. We, we didn't have a big youth ministry. We didn't have a feeding clinic. We didn't have do, we didn't have all the cool stuff that the big churches have. 
and they wouldn't come back. Amanda was as beautiful as ever, and I loved her as much as I'd ever had from the day I'd married her four years earlier. But the stuff on the outside, it wasn't that I'd lost attraction to her. It wasn't that I'd lost respect for her. It was all this stuff out here was starting to wear me down. And I would become home ill and critical, mad, or wouldn't talk at all. We fussed a whole lot. We fussed continually. And the more I withdrew, the more pressure she put on me. And what she would say to me, what's happened to the strong, courageous, young man that I married? Where are you at? What has happened to you? And can I be honest with you? I didn't know what had happened to him. I didn't know where he had gone. I didn't know what was going on. And Amanda, if you talk to her, she'll tell you the story that one day she, she, she got a job at a local factory here in town. She was driving to work early one morning and was telling God on the way to work how terrible I was and how bad I was acting. As she tells it, she was raking me over the coals and complaining about me furiously to God. Then she says, in her words, she heard the Lord speak to her and say this, let me be your husband. Stop expecting Eddie to do for the things for you that only I can do. Oh, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> As she shares in her own words, I didn't realize it, but I was setting my husband up for failure. He couldn't meet all my needs. Only the Lord is able to be everything I needed. And 40 years later, I thank him every day for telling her that. She was killing me. I used to pray, Lord, is this the price you have to pay for purdy? Do Is this what it costs to get purdy? I would almost go back and take half as purdy if I could just get a day off. Uh, Lord, thank you for speaking that to her. You see, when we make Jesus the center of our life and the center of our home and the center of our relationship, we stop putting expectations upon our mate that it's impossible for them to meet. Couples' first commitment is to the lordship of Jesus. And when it, your first commitment is to Jesus, you put fewer expectations upon your spouse to meet the emotional needs that only God can meet. Can I tell you something? God wants your marriage to work. He's for marriage more than you and I are for marriage. He wants your marriage to work. That's why he brought you two together to begin with. He didn't bring you together to get divorced or separated. He brought you together to live a fulfilling, healthy, productive, fruitful, fulfilling life. God wants our marriage to work, and he will help us in our relationship. Sometimes we just think God helps us at the church stuff and the spiritual stuff. Listen, God will help you and I, and I, we found him to help us greatly in our relationship. And the reason he wants you, your marriage to work is because your marriage relationship is an example to the world of the relationship that God wants to exist between him and us. Between him and us. Look at Ephesians chapter 5, verse 31. Look at it again. Ephesians 5, 31. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. The reason Christ wants our relationship to be wonderful, exciting, fulfilling, adventurous, joyful, the reason Christ wants to help you in your marriage so much is because when people out here in the world see your marriage and how wonderful it is, it's an example to them of how the relationship should be between Jesus and his, his bride, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
And notice what he says. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they too shall become, what does it say? One flesh. I hear this all the time. Couples will come in to see me, and they'll say, and I'll say, well, how's it going? Say, well, we're getting along better than we used to. Listen, the Lord don't want you to get along. You can get along with your neighbor. You can get along with your mother-in-law. You can get along with your boss. You can get along with people who are pains at work. You can get along with bad people. I mean, you can get along. The Lord just doesn't want you to get along. He wants you to be one. The Bible says you will become one flesh. See, the goal in marriage is to be in union, not to be just in unity. Anybody can be in unity. The Bible says as much as lies in us, be at peace. You can work hard at being at peace with people. That's not the goal for marriage. The goal for marriage is that two people become one person. You dream together. You have the same values. You have the same desires. You have the same hopes and aspirations. That's the goal of marriage. So relational shifts. You know, our pastor said this is the theme, relational shifts. So let's talk about that, the shifts that we go through in a marriage relationship. You know, just as environment, our environment has shifts, in the wintertime, it gets cold. In the summertime, it gets hot. In the fall of the year, it's normally wet. In the spring of the year, it's cold, hot, wet, and dry in Tennessee. But here's the amazing thing about the environment and the change in seasons. In the cha- with the change in seasons, our behavior changes. We know if it's cold, we're not going out there in a the t-shirt and short pants. Well, some of you are. Some of you people are crazy. <laughs> but usually if it's snow on the ground, we don't go out with shorts. And if it's the summer and it's hot, we're not wearing big old heavy Winter coats. See, with the seasons, our behavior changes. And our expectations change. In February, when we have a sunny day and it's going to be 60, they say it's going to be close to 60 tomorrow and sunny. In February, we think, this is fantastic. Now, if it drops down to 5 on Wednesday, We don't like it, but we normally say, well, that's what happens in the spring or in the winter in Tennessee. See, our expectations change. With the seasons, our behavior changes and our expectations change. Do you know our marriage has seasons? Every one of our marriage goes through seasons. And just like our behavior changes in our environmental seasons and our expectations change during the environmental seasons... So our behavior should change in the different seasons of marriage. And our expectations should change in the different seasons of marriage. In fact, the marriages that learn to successfully navigate the different different seasons of their relationship will be the marriages that last long term with health and excitement. You know... A lot of times in dealing with couples, it might be an infidelity. It might be a betrayal. It might be an abusive, violent situation that's caused the split up, that's caused the breakup, and that's understandable. But the majority of couples that I've worked with over the years that end up their relationship doesn't last, it's not because of one, one bad thing. It's never usually because of one bad thing. It might be. There have been times that's happened. They had a bad trauma or a bad betrayal that they just couldn't get over. It might be, but usually that's the exception instead of the rule. The rule is this. It's usually couples never have learned to navigate the different seasons of their marriage. So we don't have time. What, how much time do I have? Ten minutes? Are you sure I've only got ten minutes? 58, 57, 56, 55. Let's talk about two of them. You know, the first, day, the first season we get involved in when we're getting, heading toward marriage is the dating season. The dating season. The dating season normally begins with mutual attraction. I saw her and I said, whoa, hubba, bubba, 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 bubba. I want to meet her. 
She's a knockout. She saw me walking. He said, oh, 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 what a stud muffin. I know that's what she said. I didn't hear it, but I know that's what she said. We see a young lady and our smile charms us and we want to know, what is there more behind that smile? We see him and he carries himself with such, with such courage and, and swag. And we say, is he really that confident? I want to meet him. See, dating is normally the exciting, thrilling, adventurous season. In fact, in the dating season, commitment is not a priority. You don't date someone and think, well, I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, we're going to be together for 40 years. That's not a priority. Fun and mutual attraction in the dating season is a priority. Dating is all about having fun, hanging out with friends, being carefree with no demands. Dating is the season of discovery with no strings attached or unrealistic expectations. See, the truth is this. When we're dating, if we jingle, when we tingle, we will go out again. But the dating scene is usually dependent on how fun it was at that moment. In the dating season, if it's no fun at that moment, we're not going out again. That's the dating season. If, if we didn't have a good time, if I didn't have a good time with it, I'm not going out again. And I've sat with numerous couples over the years who have gotten married and they never navigated out of the dating season. I've heard him say, she don't never want to go out. She just wants to stay home. I've heard her say, he's no fun anymore. He's no fun anymore. See, that's the dating season. The dating season. A successful Healthy, long-term marriage should always expect and desire for dating experiences and feelings of dating. But my commitment to my spouse and the relationship is not determined by how often I have those dating tingles. You didn't get it. Let me go here. <laughs> my commitment to my relationship once married is not based on how often I have those dating tingles. Understand, after 43 years, Amanda and I still go out on dates. In fact, we look forward to an evening away, attending a concert. Our kids for my birthday in January bought me tickets for, uh, for a concert. We're going to the Ryman Auditorium tonight for a concert. We enjoy a long, relaxing drive. <laughs> uh, we, the older you get, the more you like to just drive. You don't even have to get out and see nothing. Just drive by it and say, boy, isn't that beautiful? That's, that's wonderful. <laughs> we love a spontaneous run to Dairy Queen. What do you want to do? I don't know. Let's go to Dairy Queen. Yippee! Hallelujah. <laughs> what a dating tingle that'll give you. <laughs> we love a going to a movie with a bucket of popcorn and butter on the bottom, butter in the middle, and butter on top. Can I get an amen in the house? Amen. See, the flame of romance and fun is vibrant and alive in our marriage. But can I tell you something? We've navigated out of that season to the point that our marriage doesn't need another spark or another night out to keep it going. We enjoy it. We love it. We do it regularly, but if it came a time that we can't do it, it doesn't determine the health of our marriage. See, a mature, healthy marriage includes dating, but it doesn't need another date to keep it going. A couple had gone out on a date to a dinner club and and they, they, the, the dinner club had a DJ, and he was spinning records. And there was a man on the dance floor doing all the moves. He was moonwalking. He, he was back flipping. He, he was doing the bankhead bounce. He was doing the Bart Simpson. He was doing the pat, cabbage patch. I mean, he was doing all the moves. And the wife says to her husband, do you see that man dancing there? He said, yeah. He said, she said, he proposed to me 25 years ago, and I turned him down. 
Her husband says, looks like he's still celebrating. See, you know, it's, it's uh, the dating season. We all love the dating season. And, and if you haven't gone out on a date with your spouse lately, let me encourage you to do that. Well, we got kids. Lock the door. Put them in the house. Lock the doors. You got a fire alarm. Go on out. Your relationship needs the dating. See, the dating season, when we visit that, even when our life gets so busy, when we visit the dating season, what it does, it reminds us, it reignites again the spark that brought that first attraction to our spouse. So every one of us need to experience the dating season, but the longer your relationship lasts, the less you depend on it to maintain, to maintain health in the relationship. Now, here's the second one, dating. Second one is the leaving and cleaving season. The leaving and cleaving. Go back to Ephesians 5.31. As the scripture says, a man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife. And the two are united into one. One of the most important but often uncomfortable relational shifts that must take place for a marriage to mature and be healthy is the relational shift that must occur between the parents and the child. Over and over, this dilemma surfaces. I deal with it constantly in working with young couples. For 18 to 25 years, the parents' opinions and preferences have been the guiding force for the child. Whatever the parent wanted is what the child did, and that's understandable. Where the parent wanted to go, the child was in tow. That's understandable. Where the parent wanted to go on vacation and how much time they wanted to spend there, the child just followed behind. That's understandable. For 18 to 25 years, the way the parent wanted you to dress, the child dressed that way because they bought the clothes. That's understandable. And for 18 to 25 years, the parent's opinions and preferences was the guiding force for their child. But suddenly, in a day's time, in a 20-minute ceremony, that dynamic and that allegiance suddenly changes. The child no longer listens to the parent first, but to someone who has paid no price and has sacrificed nothing for that child's affection. And for the child and for the parent, it can be a very difficult shift. Several years ago, when Casey, uh, probably about 10 years ago, I read a statistic that the average parent, and this was 10 years ago, the average parent, by the time a child gets 18, the average parent will have spent close to a quarter of a million dollars in raising that child. $250,000 in raising that child. And then all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, here comes this snotty nose, nappy-headed, Little boy from Hendersonville, Tennessee. And in a moment's time, my investment had vanished. And he had paid nothing. He had invested nothing. That was a difficult, difficult shift to take place in our life. You see, a man, the Bible says, leaves his father and mother. Now, we, we thought about that, and we, we normally say when you leave, we're thinking physically, physically, physically leaving. We physically leave, moving out into your own apartment, moving out into your own house, leaving mom and dad, and, and that's important because we all know too many people in one space makes it very uncomfortable at times. Both of our children, our son and his family and our daughter and her family have boomerang back to our house. Anybody else have any boomerang kids? It's okay. It's okay. They boomerang back to our house to live for, with us for, for some time when they were 
building a new house and the timing didn't work out or they moved to another city and they haven't closed on the house in the city where they're, they've moved into. So they boomerang back for a little while. And can I tell you, for a couple of weeks, it's exciting. It's fun. It breaks the monotony and the, the routine. But usually the third week, the luster begins to wear off. By the fourth week, the refrigerator has no food. By the fifth week, you feel invaded by a foreign entity. And on the sixth week, I started looking online for apartments for me and Amanda to move into. <laughs> See, the real challenge, the real challenge of this leaving and cleaving part of ministry and marriage is not the physically moving out. We know that's going to happen eventually. The real challenge is the intentional decision to leave mom and dad emotionally and for mom and dad to enthusiastically support that decision. Notice here, and my time is out. I know when Amanda starts amening me louder, she's saying, your time is out, stud muffin. <laughs> Stop it. Hold on, babe. Just hold on. Bob Sotis is up there, and I love for him to break nervous. I love for him to break nervous. <laughs> Notice the Bible says in Ephesians 5.31, a man leaves father and mother and is joined to the wife. Notice you can't become one with your wife. You can't become one with your husband until you first leave your parents emotionally. See, the leaving emotionally always precedes the joining with your mate. Well, I'm going to be still mostly connected to my parents as I always was, but I'm going to try to add my mate. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 6, no man can serve two masters. He either will hate the one and love the other or he will despise the one and love the other. And how many, how many relationships, marriages have we seen where the in-laws have such an adverse relationship simply because of that? Someone hadn't left. You see, when, we, when we're children, it, our parents provide uh, discipline. They provide, they provide for us and they bring correction and they deliver discipline. But once our role, once they get married, our role as parents must shift. Parents should no longer provide for their kids. Parents should promote good life choices. Parents no longer correct their kids once they get married. Parents give counsel. Parents no longer discipline their kids like they did when they were four, five, six, eight, ten years old. Parents offer direction. A man shall leave his father and mother and shall be joined to his wife. Now listen to me. Paul was not saying to abandon your love towards your parents. He was not saying to cease to honor your parents. He was simply saying your first priority is no longer your parents and their opinion, but the woman, the man God has brought into your life and mothers and fathers must support that. <laughs> Stand with me, would you? Well, there's three more. Three more seasons. <clears throat> the, next se the next season is the pooping and peeing season. You know what that is, don't you? Kids. Boy, won't they put a demand on a relationship. Then the next season is the empty nest season. And then the final season is the finishing season. The finishing season. Anybody ever seen the show Everybody Loves Raymond? Isn't that a great show? Ray Romano, the famous actor and the number one actor on that show, he made this statement. Look, you really want to know what marriage is really like? I'm going to tell you. You wake up, and she's there. You come back from work, and she's there. 
You fall asleep, and she's there. You eat dinner, and she's there. He says, I know that sounds like a bad thing, but it's really not a bad thing at all. God wants your marriage blessed. If you're here this morning and never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, and something's been pulling at you, something's been pulling at you, you can't put your finger on it, but something's been pulling at you, that something's not right in your life, and you know you need to have a relationship with Jesus. And you've never asked him to come to be your Lord and Savior. Or you did when you were a child, but life interrupted that. And you've been away from any type of relationship with Christ. But something's pulling you back, and you know it is. This morning, I wanna, we're going to pray a general prayer. And if you'd like to be included in that prayer, I want you to raise your hand. Anybody here? Thank you. God bless you. Thank you. God, thank you. Good for you. Good for you. Everybody repeat after me. And if you raised your hand or didn't and wanted to, repeat this after me. Heavenly Father, we believe that Jesus came to earth. He lived a sinful life, a sinless life, and he died for us on the cross. I am a sinful person. I cannot save myself. So I accept what Jesus did for me. Come into my heart, Lord Jesus. Amen. Welcome to the family of God. We welcome you to the family of God.